Hey guys, it's Dr. Justin Marcajani here. Today's video, we're gonna be looking at SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, methane dominant SIBO versus hydrogen dominant SIBO. We'll kind of take a look at those here too today. Uh, before we dive in, please smash that like button, it really helps the search algorithm. Let me know uh, in the comments section about your experience with methane and or hydrogen dominant SIBO below. I really appreciate it. All right, let's dive in. So first off, with SIBO, that stands for Small Intestinal Bacterial Overgrowth. I've done a lot of videos on that topic, so feel free. Um, we'll put some links down below where you can take a look at some reference articles on the topic. So we have bacteria, essentially, that's migrated from the colon up to the small intestine, and we start to have what's this, an imbalance in dysbiotic bacteria. The bacteria, essentially poops or farts, uh, hydrogen gases or methane gases. And of course, methane typically is gonna lead more foul smelling odor. That's kind of the rotten egg type of smell. Hydrogen usually just more of an air, airy type of smell. And these different gases can do different things in the body. So first off, bacteria is either overgrown in the small intestine or migrates from the colon up into the small intestine. This bacteria is overgrown. Typically, fermentable carbohydrates can do it, even healthy ones like broccoli and um, onions and garlic and fermentable foods that we consider to be healthy that are like probiotic rich. And these can feed a lot of this bacteria and this bacteria can grow. When this bacteria grows, it kind of makes more of these gases. It ferments, it, it putrefies, it rancidifies these type of gases, hydrogen and methane. And these gases can do different things to the motility. Hydrogen typically can cause more diarrhea, looser stools. Methane tends to cause more constipation, slower motility, disrupts that migrating motor complex. And of course, you could be alternating and have a combination of the two. That's very possible. Now, things that can predominate or let's say make the body more susceptible to a small intestinal bacterial overgrowth are going to be things like food allergens, excess refined processed carbs. Of course, fermentable carbohydrates like broccoli and onions, but those are pretty healthy. So usually there's already like this imbalance happening. And then these FODMAPs and fermentables tend to now amplify and make it worse. So usually there's food allergens, processed food, refined food. Usually there's like a, a general dysbiotic overgrowth already happening. Like common dysbiotic bacteria you're gonna see are like Prevotella, Citrobacter, Pseudomonas, uh, Klebsiella, uh, Morganella, right? These are all different citrobacter. These are all bad bacteria that when they overgrow, you can start to see more methane and hydrogen gases being produced by these type of bacteria. And of course, you'll start to see less stomach acid levels, lower stomach acid levels, lower enzyme levels. You may see a bile acid insufficiency. We're not breaking down fat adequately maybe a lot more indigestion, more fat in the stool. And then of course, we may start to see more sympathetic adrenal stress because the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic are on a seesaw. So the sympathetic, as it gets stimulated, that's the stress, stress, stress system. That starts to deactivate gastric juices and enzyme and acid levels. So you may have a harder time digesting food, then you have more indigestion, and then you start to have more gases produced by the bacteria because if food's not broken down properly, there's a greater chance that food's in a ferment and kind of rot inside of you, okay? So that's a really important component, I would say, out of the gates on that one. And so with methane or hydrogen bacteria, I mean, I'm running a lot of stool tests, so we're seeing exactly what types of bacteria are there. Now, you can run a breath test to assess what's happening from a gas standpoint. It won't tell you about the bacteria, it'll tell you about the indirect gases that are being produced by that bacteria. And so, methane dominant SIBO, um, is gonna, you're gonna see methane being produced, so you run a lactulose breath test, typically. There's glucose that will look at more bacteria in the stomach and lactulose in the first two hours of that will give you a window into the small intestine. So you basically blow into a bag, it goes to a Quintron analyzer machine, then you swallow a lactulose solution. So you have a baseline, lactulose, and then every 20 minutes up to typically 120 to um, 240 minutes. Usually tests go about three hours, but the most important is that first two hours. It's normal to see a spike in lactulose or, um, it's normal to see a spike from the lactulose, usually 120 minutes or later, because that lactulose has now migrated into the colon, the large intestine, where bacteria would typically eat that type of lactulose sugar. Lactulose is a bigger sugar. It's typically not fed on by the bacteria in your stomach or small intestine. Once it hits the large intestine, you may start seeing more feeding happening and thus gases being produced. And so, a SIBO breath test, lactulose breath test, is a good test to assess what's happening with methane and hydrogen gases. There's an X factor, there's the hydrogen sulfide gas that could be 
uh, lurking as well. And so there's other tests out there that look at hydrogen sulfide. Uh, that, that's not the purpose of this video, but you could potentially have other bacterial issues and it could be a hydrogen sulfide issue if you still have symptoms and your SIBO breath test says it methane and hydrogen are good. It could potentially be hydrogen sulfide. So keep that in the back of your head. Now, we're going to actually look at the bacteria. I'm going to do stool testing in my office. We're going to look and see what kind of bacteria they are and at what levels is there infections because you could have H. pylori, you could have a blastocystis hominis parasite infection, and that could provide the breeding ground for other bacteria underneath it. And you may think that bacteria is a primary issue. It may not be, but it could still be a big issue that should be addressed. So we have to kind of look at everything and kind of rank it in order of importance what's most to least. Also, you could have CFO or small intestinal fungal overgrowth. Some type of a candida, back, candida fungal overgrowth could be present as well, and that can disrupt motility and also cause problems. And I tell my patients, you have the right to have more than one issue going on at the same time, and it's possible. So we have to just really assess everything and look at what is most probable. So in general, there's different herbs that we use. So in my line, I have GI Clear 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So a couple things that I use. I love using berberines. I love using things like Stamona, a dill. I love using wormwood. Wormwood's great for parasites. I also like to use a lot of silver. Silver's great for biofilm disruption. Silver's excellent. It can help the herbs work better. There's different saponins or peppermint or hardwood extracts, which are excellent for methane type of bacteria. Higher dose berberine, um, clove, cinnamon, excellent for um, hydrogen-based bacteria as well. And then of course, I'll use things like Podiarco, high dose oil of oregano, great for fungal overgrowth too. And then I love to use um, black walnut hulls, which are excellent, uh, higher dose golden seal. These things are excellent for bigger bacteria, bigger bugs, parasites. Artemisia and, golden, Artemisia and berberines or golden seal together work really good. They actually have an antiviral type of effect as well, anti-parasitic effect. And I would also say um, burdock's wonderful because that's very good for the lymphatic system. A lot of times people can get overwhelmed when you're killing a lot of these bugs off, your lymphatic system and detox and immune have to respond to it. And so one, first thing is ramp it up slow to make sure you don't overwhelm your system. Make sure you're hydrating enough. Make sure you have good lymphatic support, whether it's rebounding or um, using a vibration plate or using a lymph brush or just hydrating enough getting some good movement in there. And then also you can always do sauna or take some binders as well to help. There are natural kind of things like burdock or ginger that kind of help move the lymph too, which are really, really good. So I hope that makes sense. So yeah, methane bacteria dominance or hydrogen bacteria dominance, right? The treatment doesn't change too much. So maybe some different herbs that we use for one over the other. I do, I'm a huge fan of biofilm disruptors, which can be helpful. My big two are going to be silver, and ginger, those are excellent. You can also add in things like andrographis or different systemic enzymes like serapeptidase or lumbrokinase, which work excellent as well. Think of biofilms as like, uh, my analogy is if you watch the movie 300, right, the Spartan movie, they have these shields and they have a shield up and they have a spear and they, they shield poke, right? Shield stab, right? Think of the shield, right, in one hand, that's their biofilm. It, it's a protective kind of barrier against antimicrobials coming in. So in this analogy, the Spartans are the bad guys, the Spartans are the bugs, okay? The biofilm disruptor takes the shield out of their hand and makes them more vulnerable for attack, okay? Hopefully that analogy makes sense. And that's what we're doing when we're using biofilm disruptors. Of course, we want to make sure food's dialed in. Um, one of the most underrated things that you can do with food is just because the diet's great, you may want to cook that food up more, break down that fiber, make it easier to digest, make sure that protein's broken down, chew your food up well, don't overly hydrate with your food, get your enzymes, get your acids in there, HCL, maybe add in some bile support or some extra lipase, chew your food up well, and then work on kind of a strategy to knock out the bugs. And again, some people the bugs in their tummy are really stressing them out and they may need to work on dialing in their adrenals and their hormones and their inflammation first. So if you're coming at this, don't go too soon. I'd rather go slower than not and work with a good functional medicine practitioner to kind of help sync things up and time it up so you don't make yourself feel worse. The biggest issue is when you come at it, the killing, you could potentially make yourself feel worse. So my six R's tend to work the best, done it for over a decade. Remove the bad foods, dial that in, right? Get the foods dialed in, make sure you're breaking them down. Second R, replace enzymes, acid, and bile support. Third, repair the gut lining and or the hormonal system, the adrenals. Females too may have a lot of PMS that may have to be addressed too. Fourth R is removing the bugs. That always should happen. Fourth, most people bring it and they happen it, they bring it first. We live in an antibiotic kind of kill, kill, kill generation. So having the kill phase at number four is usually hard for people to um, delay that. 
Fifth R, repopulate, re-inoculate with good bacteria. Telltale sign, you know you have SIBO, is if probiotics make you feel worse, you probably have a SIBO histamine issue. Work on that. First, probiotics come in, number five. And then 6R is going to be retesting to make sure we've knocked out the issue. So I hope that makes sense to you all. I hope you kind of resonates. I have kind of have a system and a flow in how I operate. That way I have repeatable steps so I can just cross my T's, dot my I's, and then I get predictable results because we don't skip anything, right? I hope that makes sense. If you guys want to reach out and work with me and or my colleagues, click down below for a link where you can reach out and schedule. And uh, I'm here to support y'all. Let me dive in and see if there are questions that I can answer. Again, this is live off the cuff. I call this functional medicine improv. All right. Let's see what is cooking here on my list. Uh, I'm gonna skip questions, by the way, if it doesn't pertain to the topic. Can SIBO give you body odor? Definitely can. Of course, methane can make your, make your gas uh, a little bit stinky and rotten eggy, right? And so there's that. If you have poor detoxification and a lot of gut stress, uh, you can definitely have body odor. Of course, work on the gut, work on the inflammation. My favorite deodorant is Native COS. That's a great one. Can SIBO throw off your electrolytes? It definitely can. It could potentially affect your absorption. It can create stress. When your body's chronically stressed, you may be peeing out more minerals, especially more potassium. What species of bacteria travel up the small intestine to cause this? Typically gram-negative bacteria. Gram-negative are going to have two cell walls. Gram-positive, one cell wall. Gram-negative have two. Now, gram-negative are harder to kill because it's like a castle, right? If you have two cell walls, imagine the moat is the first cell wall, and then imagine the castle wall is the second. Well, when you have a moat and then a castle wall, it's harder to, to cross the moat and the castle wall, right? There's more obstacles to get into the castle. And so gram-negative bacteria, like the ones I mentioned, Prevotella, Citrobacter, Morganella, Pseudomonas, right? These are all different bacteria that tend to be in that gram-negative SIBO category. Did a two-month protocol with SIBO with functional medicine doc. Don't feel a difference. Likely will dive deeper into the colon cleanse. Yeah, I mean, I, it's hard to know. I mean, there's different things I will look for beyond just guts, hormones, nutrients, everything else. So I need to look a lot deeper to give you more feedback on that. Any treatment suggestions for stomach ulcers? Yeah, watch yesterday's video. But again, with stomach ulcers, avoid stomach acid. Or if you use any acid, use it at the smallest level. Use it at, the, at, at a level that it doesn't cause any pain or inflammation. But ideally, if you know you have an active ulcer, no acids. You'd be surprised. Some people I've seen use a an acid product with an ulcer and they've gotten better. You know, it's amazing, but you got to work with a practitioner. My rule of thumb is no acids, nothing irritating, maybe only enzymes, everything super stew until we have ulcers under control. And then you can gently add in bitters and then acids down the road. No, no acidity if there's any active bleeding. As soon as you calm it down, you'd be surprised. Sometimes acid can actually help, but always err on the side of none and then slowly add some in as long as bleeding and inflammation is under control. Good question so far. You mentioned lymphatic support when addressing these stomach issues. When, when could a massage gun come into play? I mean, I love mas massage guns. I mean, I don't do it like for lymphatic stuff, but I mean, you could easily um, just take the massage gun or like um, the Theragun or whatever gun you have. I have one over there in the corner. Uh, just put it on a low setting and you can just rake everything to the heart. And so you can just take everything, just gently kind of move everything to the heart. Or if you're doing the back, back over this way. If you're doing over here, just move everything back to the heart like this. And they have different settings that have wider, you know, adjusters. And so you're just gently percussing and moving it up to the heart. And same thing with the brush, okay? If you have a rebound brush, if you're doing the back, it would be the back, up, and then over to the heart, okay? How long should you use a rebounder for? Yeah, I mean, you can do five minutes in a rebounder. Infrared sauna, 15 to 20 minutes is fine. Just make sure you're not leaving the infrared sauna feeling worse. And of course, have hydration and minerals in there with you. Dr. J, what type of enzymes would be good for digestion? Well, in my line, we use Enzyme Synergy, which is a broad spectrum of proteolytic, lipolytic, and carbolytic, meaning breaks down protein, fats, and carbs. That's a good one. Enzyme Synergy. Put a link down below justinhealth.com slash shop, click digestion, you'll see enzyme synergy. Dr. J, what would you suggest to lower inflammation in the body? I mean, that's a that's kind of a loaded question, right? Because it always depends upon what the root cause of inflammation. Most people, 
you know, talk about inflammation like it's this thing outside of the body. It's a separate thing that kind of like covers us like a cloud, right? It's like, well, no, usually there's inflammation from certain specific reasons. Like you could have a great diet and a great everything, but you could be exercising too hard. You could not be getting enough sleep. You could be doing too much omega-6 fat. You could be drinking too much alcohol. So the root cause, of course, has to be addressed. And of course, there's palliative things that will help, like more omega-3 fatty acids, like curcumin, liposomal curcumin, glutathione, things like frankincense, white willow bark, right? Systemic enzymes taken away from food. Those are all general anti-inflammatory supports, but you always have to draw a line. What's the root cause of the inflammation? What's palliative? So as long as you know palliative versus root cause, then you're going to be on a good track. Okay. Will a keto diet work just as well as a low FODMAP diet for starving out the bad bugs? Maybe, maybe not because you could have a keto diet and you're eating tons of broccoli and onions and cauliflower and Brussels sprouts and fermented sauerkraut and you could feel like crap and be bloated like an eight-month um, pregnant woman, right? It's very possible. So you, have to, you may have to really put more focus on shifting out the FODMAPs. We need functional medicine practitioners to work side-by-side -side with FMT docs. Um, what does FMT stand for? I want to make sure. I, I think I know what it is, but let me know. Okay, let me go over here for y'all. Oh, my screen just flipped. Let me see if I can get this the right way. Let's see, will that go? No, it's not. Okay. My screen is sideways here, guys, so it's, I have to read this at a 90-degree angle. Give me a sec. I think I had all the major ones there. Uh. Does H. pylori always show up on biopsy? No, it may not. I think I answered all the major ones, guys. Sorry, my Facebook is it's, uh, making me look upright, but everything's 90 degrees, so it's a little hard for me. Okay, excellent. Good questions, guys. Oh, a fecal microbial transplant. Yeah, so I mean a fecal microbial transplant, have I seen that work well on some patients? Yes. Have I seen it do absolutely nothing? Yes. Have I seen people get worse? Yes, I've seen all of the above. Now it makes sense because you're not, you may have this microbial imbalance, but just because you get someone else's stool and you siphon it out and put some of the good stuff back up there, doesn't mean it's gonna fix your root underlying issue. And then number two, how clean is that sample that you're getting? I mean, how do you know there's no bugs in it, right? And then how healthy is that person? There's a lot of variables in that, and I've seen people go both ways on it, and so you really have to be careful. And if you do FMT, a fecal microbial transplant, you have to make sure that you're also addressing the root cause. Don't get stuck in that this procedure is gonna be it. It very rarely works that way. How do I heal my gut with leaky gut and any other gut issues present in my body? Well, that's a podcast question. That's way too broad of a question, right? But in general, like I mentioned at the end of this video, six R's, right? Remove the bad foods, replace the enzymes, acids, digestive support, repair the hormones in the gut lining, remove the infections, repopulate good bacteria, retest, and then, of course, you're going to be plugging and playing and all the other things. But that's a podcast question. Head over to justinhealth.com and type that in the search bar and find a podcast on that topic. That's a not a 30 second question, that's a 30 minute question. Okay, hope that helps guys. Any other questions here for me? Um, let me see if I can read Facebook here. I think I answered everything guys. Apologize on the Facebook, a little tough to read here today. All right, have an awesome weekend y'all. Put your comments down below. Let me know some topics that you want me to go into next time. I'm here to serve and I love engaging in deep conversations. So let me know what you guys wanna hear.